Well, welcome everyone to the Deloitte Tax Debrief Series for Asia Pacific. My name is Suki Chen. I'm a tax partner based in Sydney and I'm your host for this webcast. Well, before the pandemic, we held our Asia Pacific Financial Services Tax Conference in person uh, in Singapore and in Hong Kong. This year, we're delivering our conference over a series of debrief webcasts. And today, we'll focus on Australia and the latest developments for the financial services industry. Uh, I'm very pleased that to be joined by four of my fellow Australian tax partners, Alison Noble, Amelia Ting, Manu Srishkantaraja and Nari Kai. Their bios are on the left-hand side of the screen. So just want to draw your attention to three brief points about our webcast for today. Firstly, you are in uh, listen-only mode. And so if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. Secondly, if you do want to download today's slides, please go to the downloads and links box where you can uh, download that. And thirdly, uh, you can download your CPE certificate uh, by clicking the request CPE icon at the bottom of the webcast console. So the agenda, the plan for today is that we'll cover the latest developments in the FATCA CRS regime with a particular focus on the current activity of tax authorities. Uh, we'll also look at the OECD, uh, Pillar 2 in particular, and then also international tax developments, both for outbound Australian fund managers, as well as inbound sovereign wealth and pension funds. And then we'll also have a look at the new fund structure in Australia after many years, the CCIV regime, and we'll have some time for Q&A towards the end. So just bringing uh, Alison Noble into the, the conversation for FATCA CRS. Alison, it's, it's been almost five years since the start of CRS, uh, about eight years since the start date of FATCA. So we've, we've moved from initial implementation to business as usual. And now we're in that third phase, the, the tax authority review phase, looking at the first two phases. Um, what is of interest uh, to Asia Pacific is really understanding the tax review activity in countries like Singapore uh, and Australia to help anticipate the trend that may occur in their home countries. Alison, what are you seeing in terms of FATCA CRS compliance reviews and enforcement? Yeah, um, thanks, Suki. So the Common Reporting Standard, um, or CRS, is a global standard and it's implemented by each participating jurisdiction. So the OECD undertakes a peer review process of how CRS has been implemented in each particular jurisdiction. And so the first round of reviews um, focused on the legal framework implemented in each country. And there's currently now a round of peer reviews focused on the effectiveness of CRS in each country, which includes how is CRS being enforced by each tax authority. So as a result, we're seeing tax authorities in participating jurisdictions um, such as Australia have really shifted, as you mentioned, to a compliance and enforcement approach. And as we're focusing particularly on Australia in this session, just highlight um, what we're seeing from an, the ATO's approach to CRS compliance. So the ATO has um, continued to roll out its program of CRS streamlined assurance reviews. And each of these reviews has a set of around 35 questions and requests for information. And once all of that information is reviewed by the ATO at completion, they issue a risk rating and determine if there's any further action required. We have seen notices of non-compliance issued, as well as FIs required to undertake remediation actions. And we understand the ATO has um, started imposing penalties on some FIs on the back of these reviews. So the information on this slide is a summary of the key issues that the ATO has identified from the compliance reviews. Things such as a lack of understanding of the core requirements, particularly around reasonableness testing of self-certification. Uh, reporting errors, um, so not reporting US accounts for CRS uh, under Australia's wider approach. Missing fields in reports, uh, reporting what they call noticeably wrong TINs, so someone's written in, I don't have a TIN, or even reporting account holders um, as residents of non-tax jurisdictions such as Antarctica. They've also found a lack of key documents, um, particularly around policies and procedures and making sure that they're up to date and that governance has been documented. Uh, uh, combined with that around a lack of, in, of reviews by an independent party, and then really a real lack of oversight around third party service providers. And, and this links into a broader issue that the ATO is focused on, particularly in the funds management space, 
where there is uh, what the ATO views as an over-reliance on third parties, uh, a lack of understanding, particularly around the processes and controls of that party, um, and a lack of governance and oversight. So we've seen this come across into the CRA space as well. And it really is important to note that the FI retains the obligation, even if the third party executes it. And so it's their FI that's subject to any penalties for non-compliance by that third party service provider. So the bar chart in the middle of this slide um, shows that around 40% of FIs reviewed by the ATO to date have either been rated as high or medium risk. Um, that's quite a large percentage of FIs that have key compliance gaps. And a few of the issues that we see from the reviews that we've undertaken, um, firstly around that reasonableness test or not even collecting a self-certification when opening the account, um, issue around the questions that have been asked on the declaration of tax residency and making sure that that is being collected for all account holders, even if they are a local tax resident. And then accepting self-certifications either without a TIN or a reason for no TIN, and you need to have one of those, or accepting a self-certification with no TIN for a country where it's known that a TIN is issued, such as the US. Um, and these three issues relate really to the information collected from the customer and the quality and level compliance of due diligence procedures. But that directly impacts the report that's ultimately lodged uh, with the ATO and then exchanged with other tax authorities. So I guess, thanks for that, Alison. So I guess um, there's two issues. One is, given what you've just said, um, on the one hand, what is the tax office communicating to the market in terms of um, its areas of concern? And then secondly, from the perspective of financial institutions, what, what actions should they be thinking about? What can they take prior to uh, these impending reviews? So um, similar to other jurisdictions like Singapore, and we might move on to the next slide, um, the ATO has developed a self-review toolkit and they released a draft of that for some targeted consultation in April this year, um, scheduled to be released to the broader public later on. And in that toolkit, they set out the approach that the ATO is taking for a compliance review. And that really helps to provide FIs with information to assess their self um, self-assess their compliance with FAT CRS obligations. And there's a real key focus on the core elements of governance, correct reporting, which links into the required due diligence and reporting systems, um, including data testing. So the guide sets out the ATO approach to reviews and its rating system and really does have some practical guidance to self-review um, compliance. And there's some useful appendices. Um, there's an appendix setting out common issues and errors, another one around data tests and a data testing sample plan, and also a self-assessment checklist. Um, so when it is released, we really encourage FIs um, to use the guide. Um, part, you might use it to prepare for an ATO review, um, to review um, the design and operation of your FACUS Ares framework, um, or to undertake a review of reporting systems and some data testing. That process of confirming that controls operating effectively can really prevent potential penalties. Um, so if I move on to the next slide, um, there are three pillars of compliance um, in the toolkit. So governance, correct reporting through due diligence and then the reporting system and data testing. And on this slide, you really can see um, the components under each of these pillars. And the ATO expects that these are present in the framework of each FI, but they might look a bit different because it will depend on the type and the size of the FI. So overall, the guide will actually be quite useful for Australian FIs um, and provide some clarity around the ATO expectations but can also be useful for FIs in other jurisdictions because it is based on the guidelines that have been issued to tax authorities by the OECD, um, although there will be local nuances in other jurisdictions. Okay, so that's, that's helpful. Then as we think about the go forward position, Alison, um, the, the OECD, given that the CRS has been in place for quite a number of years now, um, can you share with us what, what's the OECD thinking in terms of changes to the CRS going forward in the future? 
Yes, well, we do expect to see some changes over the next few years. And if we move on to the next slide, um, the OECD has been undertaking a comprehensive review of the CRS in consultation with the various participating countries. Um, really looking at changes to make information more useful and effective for the tax authorities that are receiving the reported information. So a couple of months ago in March, the OECD published a public consultation document setting out some proposed amendments to the CRS, as well as the introduction of a new crypto asset reporting framework. And so the consultation process on this document is underway. And what we actually see might be different to what's currently proposed, and then it will actually need to be uh, implemented into each participating jurisdiction. But it's worth being aware of what proposed changes um, might be coming. So the changes to the CRS um, predominantly focus around improving reportable information, but also reducing um, burdens on financial institutions. There's a whole bunch of them on this slide, but I'll just uh, highlight a few of the key ones. So firstly, expanding the reporting requirements to include the role of the controlling person for an entity account holder and the role of an equity interest holder in an investment entity. And this is really so that tax administrations can distinguish between people who have an interest through ownership uh, control or as a beneficiary versus those that have a managerial role. Um, most Australian FIs don't collect the role of controlling person, so this would be a significant change. There's also changes um, proposed around requiring the reporting of whether an account is pre-existing or new, whether a valid self-certification has been obtained, whether the account is a joint account and the number of joint account holders and the type of financial accounts. Uh, changes around clarifying the meaning of customer and business for the investment entities. So explicitly confirming investors uh, can be customers and the funds themselves can conduct activities as a business. Also changes around the reporting of dual resident or multi-resident account holders, uh, making sure they're being reported for all jurisdictions and that includes removing references in the CRS to the various tiebreaker rules under the tax treaties. Um, the exclusion of look-through requirements for controlling persons of publicly traded entities that otherwise do disclose their beneficial ownership. And then of course some transitional measures um, because there will be some accounts that are brought into scope by reason of the proposed amendments and then those that are opened post the amendments. So um, there will need to be a transition period uh, plus an additional transition period for reporting the role of a controlling person of an entity. So as well as these changes, uh, the document also includes some questions around e-money products, non-for-profit entities, and reliance on AML KYC procedures for controlling persons. Well, that's, um, that's helpful, um, Alison. Maybe just to briefly close, um, you mentioned e-money. Um, what are the latest uh, developments in terms of the proposals for from the OECD in terms of um, uh, digital and, and cryptocurrency? Um, so we are, if we just move on to the next slide, um, we are um, have seen some proposals around expanding the scope of CRS to cover digital money products and central bank um, digital currencies. And this, um, as well as some amendments, to include derivatives referencing crypto assets in the definition of financial asset and expanding the definition of an investment entity to include um, investing in crypto assets. There's proposed amendments to address duplicate reporting on financial assets in crypto form um, because um, they've also proposed a crypto asset reporting framework. And if we just move to the next slide, a large part of the consultation does focus on this um, framework and it's really been introduced um, because the crypto asset market is viewed as a real risk to the gains that have been made in global tax transparency since CRS has been introduced and that's really around that the products and intermediaries in the crypto market might not fall into the scope of CRS and so won't be subject to reporting and could be used to evade tax obligations. 
And so the OECD has based the proposed CAF on the CRS and the draft rules, um, the draft consultation document includes some rules around commentary um, and will be based around that bilateral, multilateral arrangements to exchange information um, based on the country of tax residents of crypto asset users. So there's really four main elements, the definition of a crypto asset, the definition of intermediaries that would be subject to data collection and reporting, the transactions and information to be reported, and then the due diligence rules to identify crypto asset users, <coughs> excuse me, and their tax residents, which is largely based on collection of self-certifications. So the CAF will provide a standard set of rules for information that needs to be collected, um, including tax residency and rules for reporting. And so we expect there will be a number of changes to reporting for affected intermediaries um, and onboarding that may, will need to be worked through once the CAF rules are finalised. All right, well, thank you for uh, that, uh, Alison. Um, and still on the theme of the OECD, if we pivot to um, the OECD's pillar, pillar one and, and pillar two rules, that's, that's been described as uh, one of the most fundamental changes in international tax rules in a generation. So we'll have a look at where we are at with these rules. Um, what are some of the case studies to illustrate um, the examples of how these rules uh, operate in practice for the financial services industry? And then perhaps more importantly, if you're the head of tax, what are the practical issues? What are the next steps that um, you ought to be thinking about and the market is thinking about in relation to these rules? So just bringing Amelia into the conversation, just first of all, um, there's been a lot of developments, uh, but Amelia, um, perhaps if you just share with us, where are we at with these rules and what are they? Sure, Thank, thanks Suki. Um, for those of you who have been following the development of these rules over the, the past uh, many years since the original BEPS uh, program released by the OECD in 2015, will know uh, over the last 12 months there's been a lot of development in this space and the rules are really starting to take shape. Um, back in uh, June of last year, the G7 and uh, endorsed by the G20 really came together and agreed that Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 would be a comprehensive framework that was implemented, a common approach towards these rules and, and fundamentally, you know, looking at this issue around the digitalised economy, which is, is something that has uh, reshaped the economy and reshaped the tax framework and is really calling for a new set of rules. So countries really came together and endorsed those sets of rules uh, late last year. Back in, um, in December of last year, we saw model rules released by the OECD in relation to Pillar 2. And uh, the EU closely followed that with their release on the 22nd of December last year. They issued some draft, uh, a draft directive in relation to the Pillar 2 rules. And when we say countries coming together, the OECD inclusive framework consists of, uh, of 140 countries and there's been 137 have signed up to this measure of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, so as a quick recap, as you, as you asked, Suki, what is Pillar 1 and Pillar 2? There are two very distinct uh, sets of, of rules, but they're very connected in a, in a political sense um, and there is a push to kind of implement both as a package. Now, Pillar 1 is that rule that relates to a reallocation of taxing rights between jurisdictions. Uh, it applies to the largest and most profitable businesses with a, a turnover of greater than 20 billion euro um, and will apply to reallocate some of those super profits. So profits above a 10% threshold will be reallocated to what's named the market jurisdiction. Now, importantly for, for the audience today, um, regulated financial services are intended to be uh, or expected to be carved out of what's called uh, amount A in Pillar 1, so that the most uh, prominent um, aspect of Pillar 1 being this reallocation. However, there's a lot of technical work that still needs to be done in relation to, to Pillar 1, and the OECD has effectively been drip-feeding consultation documents over the past, uh, past six months in relation to Pillar 1, including... Uh, an agenda item or a consideration of the technical elements of that carve out for regulated financial services. So we're watching that one closely. Um, pivoting to Pillar 2, Pillar 2 is a brand new taxing right. So this is the fundamental change to our international tax framework. Pillar 2 sets uh, a floor, I guess, on, on tax rate competition. It's setting a, a global minimum tax at 15% for multinational enterprises that conduct their businesses um, uh, in multiple jurisdictions. It applies after Pillar 1, so Step 1 or Pillar 1, we have a reallocation of those taxing rights. 
And then step two or pillar two comes in and uh, demands that there is at least a 15% global minimum tax applied to those profits. Now, importantly and interestingly, this uh, pillar two rules, as, as maybe we'll talk about in, in a minute, moment, um, are based on a financial accounting um, basis. So there's going to be certainly, as you said, a, a lot more work and a lot more thinking for, for tax functions to, um, to perform. Unlike pillar one, there is no carve out or exclusion for financial services per se in the pillar two rules. There are some exceptions um, to the way the rules apply to transparent entities and there are carve outs for uh, groups such as pension funds and government entities and investment funds that, um, that pull the funds of, of such excluded entities. But beyond that, there's no specific carve out for financial services as there is for pillar one, Suki. Okay, so what I'm hearing is uh, pillar one um, could be a broad based exemption for financial services um, uh, clients. Um, the details are still being working through, like many things, but really pillar two is, is the main, uh, the main um, aspect. And in particular, um, there are going to be a number of people that will get their tax effect accounting out because it's really based on uh, those aspects. Um, it's probably worthwhile, Amelia, um, if you can share with us some, some case study examples just to, um, just to work through how these rules work. Uh, in practice for financial services uh, clients. No worries. And, and if we just flip on to the next slide, um, these rules are incredibly complicated. So the rules that were released by the OECD back in December, they comprise a good 70-odd uh, pages of technical rules. The OECD's backed that up with commentary in March of this year, which, which comes to us some 200-odd pages. And so there is a need and there will be a need for a lot of uh, deep understanding of how these apply. But we've tried to simplify, I guess, the operation in a couple of case studies here for you just to uh, help you understand what, um, what, what the rules are kind of aiming at in terms of their policy objectives. So this is an illustration of uh, the income inclusion rule, which is the primary mechanism through which Pillar 2 will uh, apply this global minimum tax obligation. So the, the key point is that the uh, rules apply on a country by country basis. So here we have a multinational group within scope with a parent company in country A and various uh, enterprises in, in three different jurisdictions. Now, importantly, branches are considered to be separate entities. So one of the, um, one of the key tasks will be identifying entities in particular jurisdictions, including your branches, and making sure that there is some rigor around the separation or the, the financial accounts that are kept for, uh, for, for branches as well as subsidiaries in conformity with the parent company's um, global consolidated financial statements. Um, now, the way that the income inclusion rule works is, as I said, to examine the profits uh, on a country by country basis and examine the taxes that are paid in the, those jurisdictions. And as I'll, I'll go on shortly to explain, those taxes are measured also per the financial accounts. So this is is somewhat a, a new tax, but also based on accounting concepts and what's recorded for book purposes. But the, the theory is that we look at each of these different jurisdictions where the parent company has an enterprise and we measure the effective tax rate by jurisdiction. Now, for this group uh, in country B, there is a 20% effective tax rate, so there is nothing for this rule to do. There's a, it has met the minimum standard. However, in country C and in, in country X, we can see that there are what we call low tax profits. So the operation of the income inclusion rule will allow the parent company in country A to create this new taxing right and impose uh, a tax to collect the additional top up of um, in respect of the branch profits in country C. So here we have a 10% effective tax rate. And so it will need to be lifted or up, uh, topped up for another 5% or another, uh, another 5% to meet that minimum threshold of 15. And in respect of the profits that are allocated or determined for Haven Co, there will need to be a 15% top-ups collected in country A by Parent Co to meet that global standard. So in this way, the, um, the income inclusion rule, I guess, imposes that obligation at the parent company level. You can see that you'll need to be a number of steps to work out those various um, computations, but those obligations will sit with the parent company. If we flip over to the next slide, um, a similar concept is in play in this uh, a backup rule that is referred to or called the under tax payments rule. Now, here we have a very similar concept. Again, a multinational group needs to inspect its profits on a country by country basis. It needs to measure its financial accounting income and the taxes which are allocated to each of those jurisdictions. But this rule is a, a separate mechanism to the first case study 
And this rule will apply where the parent company is located or the headquartered uh, company is located in a jurisdiction that has not implemented the Pillar 2 rules. Now, that could be, um, even though we have 137 countries who have signed up to these rules, that could be because of the way in which the, the, uh, the rules are implemented into domestic legislation, or could be that, that the country has chosen not to, although they have committed to, to implementing Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. There is a requirement for each country to implement these rules separately. So the under-tax payments rule, similar to the first example, does look for low tax profits uh, in the global group. Here we have low tax profits sitting in country X in respect of Haven Co. But rather than the parent company collecting that top-up tax, the, the, um, the, the collection mechanism is, uh, is provided to country B and C in this example who've implemented an under-tax payments rule. Those countries effectively collect the top-up tax with respect to a formula based on the number of employees in that country and the tangible asset values in that country. So I think the key uh, here is just to remind people that where you have a, a group, and perhaps if you're in a group where the, the headquartered jurisdiction does not uh, implement these rules, there will be a significant amount of, um, of, I guess, kind of cross business unit or, or cross jurisdictional requirements to collect information. Um, and so maybe just before we, we move off the case studies, on the next slide, we do um, have an illustration here of also the, what's referred to as the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. This is effectively, again, looking at the same low tax profits in a jurisdiction, but rather than the parent country collecting the top-up tax, the source jurisdiction collects the, the top-up tax. This was a late addition to the OECD's model rules in December uh, of last year, and it is something that I think we expect many countries to, to look to implementing in their domestic legislation to combat the effects of Pillar 2. Yeah, no, no thanks for that, Amelia. So I guess um, on the head of tax um, of a financial institution uh, in Asia-Pacific uh, or otherwise um, with a number of these scenarios, I guess what I really want to understand, Amelia, is just what are the practical issues? So what are my next steps? Uh, so any advice in terms of just the um, a structured way to think about the next steps, ne next actions, given how, what you've mentioned? Sure. So the, really the next steps are to, to be prepared and to get ready. Now, if, if we look at this slide here, this is a broad brush five-step approach to how we would apply the Pillar 2 rules. There is certainly a fair degree of work for any large multinational um, and particularly I think in the financial services industry where there may be a number of branches or you may have different enterprises in different jurisdictions, just working out where profits you know, accurately sit, whether systems are available to support the, the appropriate you know, um, delineation between countries because this is a country by country basis. It is based on financial accounts, so really that data needs to be extracted from existing systems and, and recut into a very uh, new world uh, calculation, which was referred to as this globe income. Um, it, it is looking at the financial accounts to work out the effective uh, tax rate in a country and then apply this income inclusion rule. And perhaps if we flip over to the next slide, you can really start to see some of the elements that will be important to, um, to breaking down that globe income in step two and the covered taxes in step three. Importantly, it's an aggregation of all of your entities within a jurisdiction within your group. So you may have different businesses that are operating in a particular country. They will now be blended for the purposes of, of working out this income. Um, and one of the, the most interesting or, or, or critical kind of changes or, or points that was included by the OECD in the December release is the use of deferred tax expense, Suki. So I think that um, there, there is a recasting of a deferred tax expense account and many are finding that this will require quite a heavy lift in terms of the compliance obligations to, um, to determine these amounts. Okay, and it sounds like, uh, Amelia, it's, it's a, a report uh, calculations that have just not been produced for any other purpose. So it's a completely new set. Is that right? That, that, that's absolutely right, um, Suki. This is a, a brand new world somewhere in between uh, tax and accounting, I think. And if on the next slide, we just recap. There are filing obligations that would be imposed in relation to these Pillar 2 rules. The expectation is that the headquarter jurisdiction, which applies the income inclusion rule, will have a, a kind of a one-stop filing obligation in that country. There's yet to be um, releases by the OECD in relation to safe harbours regarding you know, how, how countries might be able to go about um, shortcutting some of these calculations. But at the moment, it looks like you would need to do 
ETR calculations for each jurisdiction that you're um, that you're operating in, and prepare a filing that would be shared between those countries. Those filings would be due 15 months after the year end, with an extension of 18 months in the first year, which does give some time. And I, I know that um, you know many are kind of hoping that the the first filing obligations under these rules will be some time off. But my advice would be to just you know start thinking about your impact and and how you're going to prepare your systems in advance of that date. Okay, that's a fair bit of work to do. All right, thank you, Amelia, for that. And um, still on international tax, and again, now bringing Manu uh, and Nari into the discussion. Uh, Manu, um, we think about um, outbound uh, investments from Australia, in particular Australian fund managers as they invest uh, offshore. One of the key issues that, um, that they face is the Australian uh, foreign hybrid rules. Um, there are also developments um, overseas, in Europe in particular, impacting on on tax decisions in, in Australia. So what are the latest issues? What do fund managers need yeah. to think about in that context? That's right. Thanks, Siki. As you say, um, Australians investing into offshore funds, you know, a common vehicle, as we all know, are, are limited partnerships across the world. And we, we typically see as foreign limited partnerships from an Australian perspective. Um, and, and there's typically this decision to make, if eligible, whether the Australian taxpayer as a minority investor should elect to treat their interest in that foreign limited partnership as an interest in a partnership. Because in the absence of that election, it will be treated as a company or a corporate vehicle for Australian tax purposes. Now, why this issue has gained a lot more traction in more recent times is the operation of uh, hybrid mismatch rules or anti-hybrid rules across the world, and in particularly in Europe. And the specific aspect of the hybrid mismatch rules that come into, more, come into play this year so as of 1 January 2022, the reverse hybrid rule uh, comes into full four. So what, what's a reverse hybrid and what's, what's the issue here? Well, a reverse hybrid is, a, is, an, is an entity that's formed in a particular jurisdiction that's treated as transparent in that jurisdiction, but in the jurisdiction of one of the investors, it's treated as an opaque entity. And so when you think about an Australian investor, that default treatment of a foreign limited partnership in that respect of that interest actually would cause it to be a reverse hybrid under the anti-hybrid rules. So what that would mean is, for example, in that diagram we have here, a foreign limited partnership, say, makes a loan down to a foreign entity. Any interest deductions on that loan for the foreco might be denied to the extent of the Australian investor's share of that income, or alternatively could be assessed as income in that foreign limited partnership. So it's an issue that's now actually piqued the interest of a lot of investors now as to whether they have to, or even some managers are now compelling that Australian investors ensure that they elect to treat their investment in the foreign limited partnership to be an investment in a partnership to mitigate the application of the foreign hybrid rules, or the hybrid mismatch rules, rather. So you mentioned, obviously, it's an election um, mm -hmm. and there are a number of aspects, but there are certain trade-offs. Um, it'd be worthwhile just, just hearing from you, Manu, as to what, what are the trade-offs as, um, as this election is considered uh, either made or not made? Yeah, that, that, that's right, Suki. So, you know, as mentioned, making the election, you, you potentially mitigate the application of uh, anti-hybrid rules in foreign jurisdictions. But there are obviously a number of other benefits. Um, and the key ones are really around ensuring uh, the alleviation of double taxation by virtue of allowing foreign income tax offsets to flow through the structure. For example, if Forco paid a, paid a dividend up through the structure and that suffered withholding tax, uh, we'll ensure that that dividend withholding tax will flow through as a credit, a foreign tax credit, a foreign income tax offset, as we call it in Australia, to alleviate that double taxation. Um, the other benefit is it does unlock the treaties uh, typically between Australia and the underlying source country um, because there's an alignment of, of treating the interposed entity as, as fiscally transparent. The foreign jurisdiction where Forco is would um, respect the treaty with Australia, with the Australian entity as being the relevant beneficial owner of that flow of interest or dividends and so forth. And allow a tax benefit, allow the tax treaty um, to, to apply. And that rule is actually kind of codified in, in the US, particularly. 
um, that if if Australia, for example, does not treat that foreign interposed entity as a as a flow through entity, um, the US would actually deny treaty benefits. The other key benefit is um, ensuring that the character of gains flow through. So if the foreign LP disposed of its interest in, in Forco and makes a capital gain, that nature as a capital gain would flow through to the Australian taxpayer. Um, and, and to the extent the Australian taxpayers are eligible, can, can benefit from a discount gain treatment. So that's kind of the key benefits. But, but as you mentioned, Suki, there are trade-offs and there are potential downsides. Um, uh, one, one issue we are, we are looking at is, is potential a technical risk and, and, and whether by making that election as a minority investor, whether entities that for foreign LP controls, whether or not they become CFCs in this context um, and, and subject the Australian taxpayer to the full suite of Australia's CFC rules. Now, we do think there are arguments that that, um, that should not be the case and how the rules work and operate when an election is made rather than in a control situation where the foreign hybrid might be a default CFC. And we're actually in, in, in discussions with the tax office as we speak uh, to, to get a view on, on this issue because it is becoming more and more of an issue for, for Australian investors into foreign funds. Uh, another key issue to be mindful of, particularly in the context of open-ended funds where investors come and go, is every time there's an admission of a new investor or a new partner into the foreign uh, limited partnership, that actually triggers a deemed disposal of the Australian partner's proportionate share of all the underlying investments. It triggers a CGT event. So that's something to be really mindful of and careful of, particularly when investing in open-ended funds. Now, those are the technical issues. The big kind of practical issue, though, is to, to grapple with all of this is obviously we need specific information uh, to, to understand how the Australian tax um, computations and implications are. And as a minority investor, um, you need to make sure at the outset that you've got the appropriate agreements or side letters in place with the manager to ensure that they'll be providing you with all that adequate information. Okay, so um, quite a number of different considerations uh, in in um, uh, making uh, or not making that that, that election. Um, if we just shift from uh, from the outbound focus uh, more to an inbound focus for a moment, um, yeah. we, we've seen in the last uh, number of years increasing investment by uh, inbound sovereign wealth funds and pension fund investors from throughout the world into Australia. Um, and also a number of years ago, the rules were codified uh, in Australian right. tax law. Right. Um, Manu, what are you seeing in terms of the market, in terms of how these uh, investors are responding to these rules? Yeah, that, that's right. So as you mentioned, you know, since 2019, we now have the codification of, of sovereign immunity and also a, a restriction of, of the benefits that foreign pension funds get in terms of their exemptions from interest and dividend withholding tax. We're saying now, you know, a few years on, as 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 previous rulings are expiring, and we're seeing foreign groups, foreign sovereign entities, and, and pension funds are now having to think about uh, the new rules. And as the transition provisions will expire in a, in a few years, um, it, it's a good point in time that 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 these groups are starting to think about the key differences where they got the benefit of the old regime, let's say, in the old rulings, and and now having to think about some of the issues around what the new rules are. Now, some of the key issues there, right, is, is uh, typically around this new restriction around a portfolio investment test, that to get these benefits, you, you need on an aggregated basis to have 10% of a less investment in the Australian um, security. Um, whereas in the past, particularly in the sovereign immunity context, depending on the particular context and then the particular entity that that amount could could move. And also that restriction wasn't there at all in a, in a pension fund context for, for interest and dividends. So when when pension funds and, and uh, sovereign funds are now investing in Australia, that, that's quite a key uh, threshold question to start thinking about. The other issue we're now finding when we're having discussions with the tax office is this concept of of the, the aggregation of the sovereign entity group. So, you know, you may have certain government agencies that are investing in a particular investment into Australia, but that 10% threshold has to be considered on an aggregated sense. So you need to somehow have an understanding of all other government agencies of that same jurisdiction who may or may not, who may be also investing in that 
in that investment uh, to, to get a sense of that 10% threshold. And, and the final issue is, you know, in the past, under, under the, what's called the old regime, uh, some entities, some government entities could benefit from both, sovereign immunity exemption or the pension fund exemption, where it could be seen that their funds are ultimately used in some shape or form for, for the ben retirement benefits of their citizens um, or their public servants. So this delineation is now quite hard line, so you can only be one or the other, you can't be both, um, and that's quite a, quite a significant issue uh, issue in the way the ATO is now engaging with with, with, uh, with funds in, in, in obtaining rulings. Okay. And so just bringing Nari into this conversation, um, Nari, um, Manik obviously mentioned the, um, uh, the codification of these rules, but just one point in particular, um, this, the old legacy structures that some of the pension funds uh, entered Australia no longer work. That was one of the points that, um, that we heard from Manu. Um, can you share, share some insights in terms of these legacy structures uh, and why they don't work anymore? Sure. Well, as, as Manu mentioned earlier, um, foreign pension investors previously enjoyed a withholding exemption on dividends and interest dump, regardless of their ownership stake. Um, so pension funds with significant investments in Australia um, often set up onshore aggregation vehicles and typically a trust. Um, and operationally, that was preferred, uh, particularly if you were managing a range of different investments into Australia. Um, now, under the new rules, that exemption is, as Manu mentioned, limited to portfolio investments only. Um, and importantly, that 10% cap is tested at the first entry point into Australia. So that means even if the underlying economic interest is less than 10%, um, if the first entry point into Australia, so um, your aggregation vehicle is more than 10%, that exemption is no longer available. Okay. The, the other practical uh, aspect is uh, that this industry that, that we're talking about is very outsourced, um, not just sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, but just fund managers in, in particular. There's a heavy use of custodians uh, in a number of cases. So just thinking through from the perspective, the lens of a custodian, from a practical perspective, what, what are you seeing in terms of what Australian custodians uh, have wanted in the market as a consequence of the codification? Sure. Um, so when custodians make payments to a non-resident entity, it's the custodian itself that actually has the obligation to deduct the correct amount of withholding tax in Australia. So what we've been seeing in the market is that most custodians have a policy um, where there's any sovereign or pension investors that are seeking to apply a withholding tax exemption, um, they are asking to be provided with a copy of an ATO private ruling or advice from a third party advisor in order to apply that exemption. So as Manu alluded to earlier, this is one of those factors that has been adding to the need for sovereign and pension investors um, to reconsider the tax position under the new rules and, and uh, get rulings refreshed. Okay, that's, um, that's helpful. And maybe just to pivot uh, to something completely new. Um, so one of the exciting developments that, that we referenced in Australia is a new fund structure to so the CCIV, um, the Corporate Collective uh, Investment Vehicle, uh, and a new acronym as well in the uh, Australian tax law. Um, we'll talk about three things. So first of all, what is the CCIV? Uh, and then secondly, how does it compare? So how does it compare to both fund structures in Australia as well as uh, fund structures in the region in Asia Pacific, and then finally, just some thoughts as to whether we think it's a game changer uh, in Australia. So perhaps if we just set the scene first, Nari, the MIT structure, so the Managed Investment Trust, um, at fifteen percent headline rate compared to thirty, that's been the dominant funds vehicle in Australia for many, many years. Um, why do we need a new fund structure, and what is the CCIB? Sure. Well, the problem with the MIT structure um, is that it's legally a trust. It's not particularly user-friendly. Um, and so particularly for global investors, those from civil law countries, they're more familiar with corporate vehicles than trust structures. Um, so what is the CCIV? So for the first time in Australia, we do have a hybrid vehicle um, and that's intended to deliver the best of both worlds. It's taxed like a trust, um, but in legal form, it is a corporate structure and it's limited by shares. Um, it's intended to be more familiar to foreign investors and, and it's ultimately a stepping stone into the Asia region funds passport. Um, the good news is it's now law, only took 10 years, um, but it is different from a trust structure. So first, um, the CCIV consists of an umbrella vehicle with sub funds. 
Um, that enables CCIVs to offer multiple strategies under a single corporate vehicle. Um, CCIVs can vary their capital structure by redeeming shares and paying dividends from capital. Um, and similar to an MIT, it does allow retail and wholesale investors. But from a tax uh, perspective, it's very similar to our existing MIT structure in that it's taxed um, like a trust, like a flow through. So just thinking through, yeah, just how does the CCRV compare with, with other fund structures in, in, in the region? Sure. Well, in the appendix to the slides, we do have a detailed comparison table, but in a very few brief comments, um, in each case in, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Australia, the umbrella vehicle has a separate legal personality, um, but not the sub funds. All of them are variable capital companies. So each vehicle can vary their capital structure by redeeming shares. Uh, paying dividends out of its capital. Uh, the one key difference is that in Singapore, they've gone down a corporate path. So the Singapore VCC is not a flow through for tax, um, whereas the Australian CCIV is a hybrid. So company in legal form, but flow through for tax purposes. Um, but Singapore and Australia, they're both hampered by the same issue in terms of scale. So there's currently no transitional rules that allow existing funds to restructure into the new fund vehicle free of a tax cost. Um, so ultimately, as each of these new fund structures get more traction, the big question will be, will any of these be the dominant vehicle in Asia Pacific? At least from an Australian perspective, um, that's the subject of a lot of consultation with government. Um, we have argued that the withholding tax rate in Australia in general is seen to be a bit less competitive than our regional counterparts. Yeah, so that's helpful to, to understand. I guess um, one aspect is then now the, the crystal ball gazing, right? So we've got um, new fund structures in, in the region. So as you say, Singapore variable uh, capital company, Hong Kong with its um, open-ended um, um, entity, the OFC and the, the limited partnership fund, and now in Australia, the CCIV to complement that. Um, one of the regulatory bodies in Australia has, um, has gone out and stated that... Uh, that the CCIV uh, will become the dominant vehicle in Australia. So that's a big call. Uh, just your perspective, um, will this be a game changer in, in Australia? Well, at least in the short term, I think it will be very much like the USIT. So when the USITS was initially launched, there were a lot of regulatory and other teething issues, so it didn't really lift off. Um, but with the passage of time, subsequent versions of USITS have made it incredibly successful. So I anticipate that the CCIV will follow a similar path, at least initially. Um, in the immediate term, there has been a lot of interest, but just not a huge uptake. And there's a number of reasons. In the short term, there is less certainty on tax. Um, so to achieve immediate scale, we have asked the government for transitional tax rules that allow existing structures to become CCIVs with no tax um, problems. That didn't make it into the law. Um, the stamp duty and GST rules uh, are still in development and there are obviously teething issues with the CCIV vehicle being a hybrid. So for example, when the CCIV pays dividends, it's deemed to be a trust distribution for tax. Um, but if the CCIV has accounting losses and taxable income, there's a bit of a gap in the rules. Um, at present, we can use the existing trust structure to create an umbrella vehicle with multiple strategies by using an AMIT with multiple classes of units. Um, but some participants in the industry are excited with the CCIV because of the liability is quarantined within each sub fund, which is quite different than the AMIT structure. Um, so in the longer term, I expect there'll be a greater uptake of the CCIV as the rules get refined. Um, and you know, beneficial ownership in the context of tax treaties is an issue for trust. So over time, CCIVs being a company may well provide greater certainty. Okay, so what I'm hearing uh, at the moment is that at least in the short term, there's still some tax issues, um, tax uncertainties where it's um, probably better to use uh, the, the AMIT 
uh, the existing trust structure rather than a, a CCIB, particularly where there's still some rules to come. Um, but on the other hand, um, some participants are seeing that uh, there are some advantages, particularly on the legal front, um, where uh, sub funds are being used as compared to um, to an AMIT because um, uh, of the quarantining issue. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, how that all develops. Well, that's um, that's all very good. Um, this does bring the the formal part of our uh, web class uh, in terms of the presentation to a close. We've got the Q and A. Um, we've got some time now to um, to take some questions uh, for that. And one of the, the questions that has come up is, is obviously um, the, the big news in Australia is uh, the, the election. So we've had a change in government. Uh, the Australian Labor government is, um, uh, is now changed um, uh, and we've got Anthony Albanese. So maybe just bringing uh, Amelia to, uh, to the conversation. So from the perspective of the new Labor government, um, what are the major tax changes that financial institutions uh, need to think through? Um, and are there any changes that we need to think through as um, even for the matters discussed for this presentation? Sure, sure, Siki. Uh, um, tax wasn't, you know, a really high uh, on the agenda of the policy debates uh, throughout the kind of the, uh, the campaign. But what we do know is that the tax policies that the ALP is going to be um, implementing do contain some measures that focus on cross-border and international tax and multinational uh, tax issues. In particular, the pillar two um, rules and reforms that we spoke about today, ALP does endorse those and, and has put its support behind them in consistent, uh, in consistent measure with, with the coalition's policies. The big question on that one is really timing. So the OECD has proposed that those rules apply from 2023, which as we sit here today in May seems extremely challenging and I think the OECD recognises as well that that timeline may well um, be slipping. The, the kind of the latest um, thinking in the EU, which has not yet endorsed that EC directive, which I mentioned was released on the 22nd of December, means that a, a very likely start date would be in 2024, but we're really waiting to see um, what, what the new government kind of brings to the fore in terms of that legislation. The other significant measure that will be of interest um, for the financial services space, Suki, will be the announcement to replace the thin capitalisation safe harbour rule with a 30% EBITDA uh, interest limitation. Now, that is a, a rule that is, is based also on an OECD BEPS recommendation from back in, in 2015. I believe that the, um, the policy start date was intended to be uh, 1st of July 2023, so I guess that's coming much nearer and we'll be very interested to see how that policy develops into, into legislation, particularly as, you know, the current thin cap rules and the safe harbour rules do have some concessions and, um, and special rules for financial entities. It'll be interesting to see if this new replacement law contains those same concessions. Okay, so watch this space on, on thin capitalisation in, in particular. Um, so whilst we do have you um, speaking on the, the Q&A, one of the questions that has come up is just, um, on the effective tax rate that, that you mentioned in, in your segment on Pillar 2, uh, there was an interest in ter terms of trying to understand um, a little bit more in terms of the mechanics of the, the effective tax rate. Um, can you maybe just talk a little bit more in terms of that to answer that question? Sure. It's a very mechanical rule and it really will come down to uh, extracting the data from systems to work out kind of those two core core numbers that will feed into the effective tax rate. So in the, um, in the denominator, the globe base or the pillar two base will be the financial accounting profit or loss with very few adjustments for things that are common um, adjustments between book and tax. So for example, things like um, dividends and equity gains will be excluded from the financial accounting base to derive what's called the globe base, which will be the denominator in that effective tax rate calculation. In the numerator, Suki, this is also based off the accounts. It's a current tax expense, plus or minus the deferred tax uh, movements to reflect timing differences. But where this will depart from what would commonly be picked up in the financial accounting is that there are many more adjustments for what is included in the current tax expense and a recomputation of the deferred tax expense. Um, the idea is that if a deferred tax is being booked at a rate higher than uh, 15%, in order to realign that with what the global minimum tax rate is, which is 15%, is that um, companies will have to recompute their deferred taxes at that, that minimum rate. So what that will mean is that there will be a lot of adjustments made to the tax accounts 
and a new kind of figure will need to be worked out to, to determine the covered taxes which form the numerator of that ETR calculation. Okay, no, that's, um, that's helpful. And one of the other questions that um, has, has come up relate to um, uh, the foreign income tax uh, offsets and in particular um, the issues that arose from um, a, a leading tax case, the case of Burton. Um, so perhaps bringing uh, Manu and, and Nari to, uh, to answer that question, the, the, um, the question is um, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in relation to these rules. Um, what are you seeing in terms mm. of what the, the tax office um, um, is, um, is thinking in relation to these rules and, um, and also um, what are your uh, recommendations as to how uh, clients should be thinking about uh, foreign income tax offsets? Yeah, thank, thanks, Suki. And as you mentioned, so the Burden case, basically, just to recap, uh, is a case, the decision where if you've got a capital gain flowing through on which you suffered foreign tax and that's a, you enjoy a discount on that gain, say 50%, then you're effectively only entitled to, to half, the, half the credits, very simplistic terms. But that's the issue, that it's kind of an overly simplistic way of looking at things where in real life things are a little bit more complicated than that because the way you compute gains for foreign tax purposes is different to the way you compute gains in Australia. What does that mean with the impact of losses, for example, foreign currency movements, the way cost base is calculated? So you're never going to get this alignment between what on the thing on which you paid foreign tax and the thing on which you're, you're including an accessible income and, and, and getting the benefit of a discount. So those issues are being kind of worked through. You know, in practice, you can you can see taxpayers taking pretty much a simplistic approach that if I've got a 50% discount, I've got a one-third discount, then I'll just take half my credits or, or a third of my um, – or two-thirds of my credits. Um, but I think going forward, these discussions are being had, Suki, with the industry and the tax office of how specifically it's all going to work. Um, and more importantly, when you have flow-through structures like AMITs, how, how are you going to be reporting that to the ultimate investors, given there's a calculation that should be done at an AMIT level, but then ultimately that information has to flow up to the investors when their own specific attributes and they're ultimately entities that are taking the discount and how we pass on that information. Um, so those practical issues around how to actually report also becomes quite important and important to think about. Okay, um, Nari, anything else that, that uh, you wanted to add in terms of um, Burton and the foreign income tax offsets? Sure, I think that as Manu has, has touched on, there are a lot of practical issues, particularly in, in the context of the funds management industry. Um, if you are a fund manager, there are a lot of questions as to how you go about calculating the, the total amount of tax paid, particularly if there are differences between Australia and the offshore jurisdiction as to who is the relevant taxpayer. So assessing that is can be quite a complex um, issue. And then in terms of how you go about reporting that information to your investors, particularly in circumstances where you're relying on third parties like custodians or registry services to go and report that information, how would be how would you go about actually physically um, presenting that information, even if you are able to actually perform that computation yourself? Okay, um, we just got time for that's one last question, and that relates to the sovereign wealth fund uh, rulings that Manu and, and you spoke of. Um, the question is: Are you seeing the tax office actually giving them out? What uh, What are you seeing in in practice? Sure, I mean. Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, the tax office is still giving out um, rulings. I think the, the way that the tax office has approached that ruling process has changed somewhat. So because there is now a legislative regime, um, the tax office is looking at all of the technical requirements a lot more closely. So as Manu mentioned earlier, that distinction between sovereign funds and pension funds is being looked at a lot more closely than it used to before. Um, and then in terms of that aggregation point, I think some of the, the practical challenges for um, sovereign entities applying for rulings is around how they're going to show or demonstrate to the tax office that they don't have a related government organisation that also invests into Australia that would allow them, or that would result in them breaching that portfolio interest test. So um, the, the tax office, um, as far as I've seen, have, have been reasonably um, practical. Um, it's just about being able to demonstrate what processes you have in place to go about monitoring that um, investment threshold in Australia. 
Okay, no, that's, uh, that's all helpful. Thanks for that. Well, this um, uh, takes us to the top of the hour. It brings our web class to, uh, to a close. Much appreciated uh, for joining us today. Um, but please, um, would really appreciate if you uh, please fill out uh, the survey that will pop up on your screen momentarily uh, and tell us what you think about today's program. This presentation will also be archived for future viewing as well. So please feel free to share this uh, webcast um, using the uh, share um, this icon, or you can visit the uh, Deloitte uh, debriefs uh, website. If you have any questions uh, or comments, um, please um, reach out to, to me or one of the speakers today. More than happy to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next scheduled uh, webcast from the financial, se financial services industry series. Uh, and that's on 30 May. That's titled uh, Tax Policy Developments uh, and Reform in Asia Pacific. So thank you once again for joining uh, and uh, thank you everyone.